Welcome to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers Podcast. Each episode will bring you conversations from business leaders and up and coming stars in the commercial real estate industry in Canada. Our guests will share their unique career journeys, passions, and advice on what it takes to be successful in this industry. This podcast is brought to you by Highview Partners, connecting people who perform in Canadian real estate. I'm your host, Richard Costello, and today I'm pleased to introduce Nada Sutik. Nada is currently Director of Programs in Operational Excellence at Quadreal Property Group, responsible for the development and delivery of programs that support property management teams throughout Quadreal's managed portfolio. Nada's focus is on enabling the front lines in property management to deliver excellence in customer service, risk management, and building operations within the property portfolio. Nada is also chair of the board for BOMA Toronto. Prior to her current role in operational excellence, Nada spent five years in property management, leading teams to manage an office and industrial portfolio of 4 million square feet. She also led sustainability at Bentall Kennedy for several years following her years at BOMA Toronto and BOMA Canada, leading the growth and management of BOMA Best and other environmental initiatives. Nada has an undergraduate degree at the University of Waterloo in Environmental Studies. Nada, a big welcome to you and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rich. Glad to be here with you today. Let's start off by hearing about your career journey so far. As I just mentioned, you majored in Environmental Studies. What influenced you to pursue this line of study? I won't lie, Rich. I, uh, I certainly struggled to decide. Um, you know, as you you yourself may recall, at the age of, you know, about 18, you're trying to make these decisions which are going to influence uh, the rest of your life, which at that time you realize you, you don't necessarily realize that things can change. Um, so there's a lot of pressure to decide. And, and you know, frankly, I had a lot of interests, uh, business, engineering, as well as environmental studies. And, um, you know, in terms of what really influenced me, though, I'd say as a kid who, you know, grew up in the country um, and, and, you know, my parents came from post-war Yugoslavia, so they didn't grow up with much so the ideas of conserving resources and, and making do um, and, you know, saving from a rainy day and, and as well as being connected to the land and farming, you know, those things were all really, really sort of ingrained into me. And then in, in addition, in the 80s, 90s, you know, recycling at home became normalized. Um, we solved for acid rain through collaboration and, re- and regulation. There was a hole in the ozone layer. So there were some really big environmental issues that were getting a lot of attention and you know, seemed to be getting solved. And then business was really starting to see some opportunity to do more to reduce environmental impact. So I think all of those factors together for me um, are really what what ultimately landed me in environmental studies. And uh, and I had the opportunity prior to deciding to, you know, meet some of the professors that that I would end up working with at Waterloo and uh, and they left quite an impression. So definitely they were a factor in uh, in that decision as well. Yeah, that's awesome. So what was your first job after university? And perhaps walk us through the path you took from that point. Yeah, so I worked for an environmental not-for-profit in Mississauga called EcoSource. They're still around and doing all kinds of great work that's, you know, certainly expanded quite a bit from from the time when I was there. Um, I was laid off actually due to a funding change. Um, so, so then I joined a small firm doing waste management consulting uh, financial analyses, waste audits for compliance, things of that nature may have included a little bit of dumpster diving along the way. And, uh, but the core of the clients were commercial real estate organizations. Um, so while that wasn't, you know, a long-term fit for me, um, I briefly worked independently and then I started working for BOMA Toronto and then ultimately BOMA Canada, uh, working on the, the BOMA Best program among other things. And, uh, and so after several years there, I was able to, um, to join Bentall Kennedy, where I, I led the sustainability program and then efforts for several years there uh, in terms of, you know, helping to build out the the programs and so on there with sustainability before ultimately moving into property management, um, where I then managed portfolios for about five years uh, before moving into my current role, heading up programs and procurement and operational excellence uh, last year. So what have been some of the ways you've invested in yourself? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think in terms of investing in myself, you know, I can sort of sit here now and and think about it from a a broader perspective. So career wise, um, you know, certainly networking and and you know joining Boma and being a big part of Boma um, to me has really proven to be an investment in myself. As much as I have the opportunity to give back and uh, and I get a lot out of it, um, you know, I think that's also been been really beneficial for me in in so many ways. You know, and then certainly courses and webinars and conferences and and things like that. 
Um, I did have my, you know, lead uh, green associate for a while. So that's since lapsed uh, some real pack courses and so on. And, and recently I completed a, a change management certification mm-hmm. with ProSci, but you know, and from a broader perspective on a more personal level, I'd say there's also the, you know, identifying the relationships that are important to me, my family and my friends, and really investing in my health and my well-being and eating well and, and actually making time for me and taking care of my financial future. I think, you know, that investing in myself is all of those things. Mm. Um, and it's really kind of bringing all of that together. That's a great answer, Nada. We definitely have to look after ourselves in order to offer our best to others. As the saying goes, you can't pour from an empty cup. So reflecting back, what has been the most difficult professional challenge you have had to overcome? Yeah, I, I think there are, um, you know, it's probably a handful to choose from, no question. But I think the the most difficult thing for me has been anytime I've really thought about changing roles, um, you know, internally, whether it's been an internal move within an organization or externally moving to a different organization, um, I've always found that to be uh, challenging. You think about the the relationships that you have at work. Uh, the people you might impact when you make a move, perhaps work you're leaving behind or or even a little unfinished. Um, And then, you know, a team that perhaps you've been leading, but recognizing that you have to put yourself first and that that, you know, can mean different things at different times, um, you know, depending on where you are at, at, you know, what stage of life and so on. And so, you know, making those those types of changes and really saying, yeah, I'm going to put myself first. I'm not going to, you know, uh, worry as much about, you know, all of those other people that I'm going to impact. And I've got to do what's right for me and right over that long term. It's, um, you know, it, it, I've always found that challenging. Uh, it comes easily to some folks, but, you know, for me, it's, it's had to be a really conscious effort, uh, even though, you know, making those types of changes is also really exciting and challenging. And there's a lot of really positive things about it. Um, you know, it still kind of brings all of that together. And, and I think for women in particular in the workplace, sometimes that putting yourself first can be a little bit more challenging where likely to be a little uh, a little less conditioned to put ourselves first. We are more likely to be conditioned to support others. Um, so when you try and move away from that and you try to, pardon me, when you try and move away from that and you start to challenge the stereotypes, uh, the labels might come, the way you're perceived uh, can change. And um, and yeah, so there's just some some different things to, to consider there. So yeah, I think for me, that's that's always been been a challenge. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, it's, it's a professional challenge and a personal challenge, but also always exciting. And there's a way to go about it, isn't there, to ensure you maintain those relationships? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, a really important piece as well is you never want to burn bridges. It is, um, it's a small industry and, and, you know, thankfully it's, it's filled with a lot of great people. Uh, so leaving those bridges well intact is, is, you know, that's not too hard. So what about your proudest moments so far? What would you say they are? Um, you know, I think there are several things I can look back on and, and, uh, you know, with, with some pride and and a sense of achievement, but I I will say, I think something that occurred for me, uh, just this spring is actually becoming the chair of BOMA Toronto. Uh, and it took me a little bit by surprise, just how uh, great that felt and how proud I was. Um, you know, I was moving from chair elect to, to chair. Um, so I knew that was coming. I'd been on the executive already for, for a couple of years, um, but the the warmth and positive reception that I had from my industry peers and, and colleagues um, took me a little bit by surprise, and uh, and it was just a really you know a great moment. And um, what I really enjoy is that I, I really feel like I'm able to give back to the organization and to a community, the real estate community, um, you know, especially in Toronto, that has given me so much in in my career so far. Um, you know, the people that I've been able to connect with and to get to know and to work with and to learn from. It's been absolutely tremendous. And now to be the chair at a time when, you know, we're going through one of the most challenging times um, in in quite some time with the coronavirus pandemic and now, of course, a major shift in, in thinking about diversity and anti-racism and, and so much attention on that, which is fantastic. Uh, there's just there's so much going on. Um, so I, I feel very fortunate to be, um, you know, in, in the role of chair now and to help guide the organization through these, uh, through these times. So I'm really honored to be a voice in BOMA, uh, where we're helping to bring people in the industry together to collaborate, to focus on solutions, to focus on getting through it. And honestly, just to, to support each other. And especially with, you know, supporting some of the younger professionals in the industry, um, to learn and, and to grow through this. I mean, they are our future leaders. So that's probably the most exciting and, and rewarding piece of it. 
Well, Nada, that's a big commitment and a great achievement. Congratulations. I think Boma is very lucky to have you. Thank you. So switching gears a little here to talk about what drives you to perform your best work, Oprah Winfrey is quoted as saying, passion is energy. Feel the power that comes from focusing on what excites you. So Nada, what are your professional passions and how do these motivate you at work? There's many things that I'm I'm passionate about, um, but I think what I really bring to work is, you know, the idea, the drive to just do things better, um, and and that is um, I don't necessarily think of it as a, a passion, but it is the thing that gets me out of bed every day. Is like, how am I going to do something better? Um, and it's you know, it's to be more efficient in in how we achieve our desired outcomes. Um, everything I get into, I'm looking for how do we do this better? How do we improve this process? How do we make, you know, this requirement easier for our property managers to execute on. You know, for example, if we're trying to get better at delivering customer service, um, you know, we're thinking about, or what I try and think about is, well, what does that take? What does that mean? Like, let's first actually define what we mean by that um, and and ask some questions. And then I like to take the things that we say and, and try and tear it down and pick it apart and get clarity about what it is that we're actually trying to do. And then you define the requirements and then you rebuild um, even better, right? So, so for me, the passion is is about getting that honesty about what are we trying to do, uh, and then getting to the efficiency of of doing it better. And what steps do you take to discover passion at work? I think for me, it's it's really about maintaining alignment with values. And a couple of years ago, or a couple of years after university, rather, I I was having you know some sort of crisis of what am I doing with my life, and um, and so I took advantage of some resources that were available through my alumni office. And in doing so, I, I went through a process, you know, answering just lots of questions and questionnaires, et cetera, which, you know, somehow came together and ultimately returned a, a brief list or, or a summary of what my answers identified as being really important to me. And, you know, I took whatever output that was and I, I jotted down the five things on a little piece of paper, which I still have, you know, you know, those junk drawers that you have at home. Um, and it's, you know, that, that's where it lives. And so every now and then, if I need to sort of go back and, and look at it, it's, you know, all of those five things, they all still apply. And, and for me, they're sort of competence and expertise, honesty and integrity, uh, balance, learning and knowledge and productivity. So, you know, for me, it's, you know, all of those five pieces coming together, that's sort of the values that really kind of fit into my work. And, and that continues to sort of link into the passion. Nada, how will you define success in your career? I think for me, Rich, it's, it's to always be learning it's to always be challenged and to want to do the work. Um, I think, you know, if I'm always learning and then, you know, I guess to, to go a step further, am I helping other people learn? You know, that's, that's the piece that, you know, um, is both, it's, it's satisfying to be learning, but to actually help someone else learn and watch them grow um, and share that knowledge and kind of, you know, pass it along. I think that's, that's really what success is. And, and to be, you know, challenged along the way to, to really want to do the work to, you know, have those, you know, problems or issues that come up that you can start to tackle and, and figure them out. Um, you know, that's for me, that's how I learn. Um, and so I always really enjoy those challenges. So, it's, yeah, it's that combination of, of kind of learning and being challenged and, and being able to share that. Would you like to join an industry association that develops, promotes, and advances best management practices? The Building Owners and Managers Association, known across the industry as BOMA, provides members with access to exceptional education programs and events and valuable networking opportunities. The Toronto members include leading building owners, property and facility managers, developers, and industry suppliers. To learn more about the association and how you can become a member, visit bomatoronto.org. Well, let's get into the details of your current role now then. I'd like to explore a couple of themes. First off, standard operating procedures. So can you explain how standard operating procedures bring value to an organization? Sure. So I deal with programs and procurement. And I guess, you know, a little bit more broadly, it's not just the standard operating procedures. It's operational excellence, right? And I really like that term that we have. Um, you know, it's doing everything in line with your objectives, trying to, you know, find the efficiencies, whether that's cost, whether that's um, people's time, um, or, you know, or being able to um, reduce the number of steps in a process, for instance. So, you know, with standard operating procedures in particular, I really believe that they actually make us more flexible. You know, when you say that, that term, 
it sort of sounds like it's going to be rigid and really prescriptive. And it, it can be. But the point is that you can't really prescribe everything. And, you know, I think where we want our property management folks to be able to spend their time is not on the stuff that's obvious and that we already know where we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Let's just give them that information so that we have a way that we can say, yeah, this is how we do things. And that's simple and easy. And then people can spend their energy and their day to day on, you know, being with their customers and, um, and, and spend that creativity on the problems that we can't solve with a standard operating procedure. You know, that's where, you know, they, they can really, that's the high value um, kind of work, right? So just for example, like instead of having, um, you know, everyone kind of developing their own, for example, uh, you know, their own approach about how to do a vacant suite inspection for industrial properties, what to look for, et cetera. Well, we have a pretty good sense of that. We can just write it down and make it a, a standard operating procedure. It's not complicated and it's not like anyone's doing it wrong, but if we make it an SOP, well, then it kind of streamlines things for us. And then as a bonus, right, then we, we've got a standard process. Then we can also have a standard you know, checklist or something like that for people to use. And then we can effectively start to generate some data from that checklist. So now we're starting to get more value out of that. We start to understand some common issues that we see. And then if we standardize that information and how and where it's stored, we can create access to that. And then we can actually learn from all of that together and we could probably start to solve for, you know, for an issue that we can actually get ahead of instead of always finding that it's an issue. So it's, you know, it, it kind of is a whole broader process that can lead to that. And it's a way to get everybody on the same page as well. And so, so I think that's important. Well, Nada, you recently completed a certificate in change management, which is a fitting qualification to have in the context of the global pandemic we continue to live through. What do you predict might be some of the lasting positive changes that this will bring about? In terms of the uh, the pandemic, I mean, I think some of the the positive changes, a little bit of slowing down, you know, and I'll say sort of, um, it's been nice not to have to rush around. And, and though I, I do know a, a lot of folks, uh, including myself, who've been a lot busier at work. Um, so there's been a bit of slowing down of you're not rushing from home from the office to then get to that other commitment that you have in the evening and that sort of stuff. Um, but, but I know, you know, we've all still been pretty busy. Um, you know, I think a positive thing is uh, I really, I see my neighbors a lot more and in some ways there's a greater sense of local community. And I think people have really enjoyed and appreciated that, uh, you know, and as much as people are getting, you know, certainly antsy to get out again, uh, that people might make some different choices about how they spend their time going forward. Um, and, and what I will note is, you know, I think that importantly, just want to acknowledge that's a very privileged place that I'm that I'm coming from, right? It's a place of security in terms of employment and housing and food and general safety. Um, so, so the, the you know those silver linings are not hard to find in, uh, in in that sort of scenario. Well, back to the topic of change management. So, this might sound like an obvious question, but what is change management, and how does it impact the commercial real estate industry? Yeah, so change management is really, I mean, it's applying a set of processes and tools to lead the people side of change to achieve a desired outcome. Um, so, you know, where project management is more the, you know, what are all the pieces that you're going to do and what's that that sort of process you're going to go through to get to the outcome. Change management is really about the people. Um, and it's a leadership competency for enabling change within an organization. At an individual level, you know, there's kind of five key elements that we talk about to sort of get any of us to change, right? So, you know, um, it's a simple sort of five-letter acronym, ADCAR. So there's awareness, you know, being aware that there's a need to change. Desire, having some desire to support that change or, you know, understanding really, hey, what's in it for me? Uh, knowledge. So having, you know, the actual knowledge set or the um, to, to do the change and to, to perform that change. And then the ability is the skills or behaviors, kind of the tools that you need to change. And then finally, reinforcement. What's going to make that change stick? Um, that might be that your old way just no longer works, um, or, or the new way might have a greater reward for you, right? There might be more in it for you that way. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the, at the individual level, um, you know, in terms of the impacts on, on the real estate industry, I'd say, you know, it's not just this industry, like everything is changing more and more all the time. Um, I think, you know, we've been hearing it for a long time that the only constant is change. Um, and I think that's very, very true in the pace of change has, uh, you know, certainly seems to have been speeding up. So I think we're all going to need to get better at change management and at understanding it as a formalized process and an actual way to implement change as an important part of any project. Um, You know, just doing, you know, the technical side of a project, for example, doesn't necessarily get it actually done. 
right? There's always humans involved. So it's getting those people to, to sort of come along with you, right? And I think for real estate, um, you know, we're going to need to get on board with that in a, in a bigger way than we have and catch up with, you know, for example, with some of our tenants. Um, you know, when you think about the big banks, uh, you know, they already understand a lot of this and uh, in, in many cases have entire departments devoted to change management and have an array of change management professionals within their organization. So, you know, I think that's, um, that's something that we're going to need to catch up with a little bit on the, uh, in real estate. Listening to you explain the five steps involved in bringing about change, I'm drawn to recent events and the Black Lives Matter movement that's having such a powerful and awakening effect. For many, myself included, it's prompted a deep introspection and evaluation of individual privileges and a real thirst for education and a desire and a serious pledge to be and to do better. So we're recording this on June 19th, and I feel ignorant to admit that I didn't know the meaning of Juneteenth until recently. Juneteenth celebrates the emancipation of African Americans from slavery. On June 19th, 1865, Union Army Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas to inform slaves they had been freed. This was over two years after the Emancipation Proclamation had been issued by President Lincoln. What do you think, Nada? Could the same principles of change management be applied to help individuals and organizations address these issues? I think, you know, we all, we all know there's not a quick way to get to the changes that we really need to get to. Um, you know, as you mentioned, right, Juneteenth, I mean, that's going back to 1865. That's a long time ago, and there's still a lot, um, there's still a lot of work to do. So I think there are some deep problems uh, in terms of, you know, not just getting you know, people to not be racist, but to understand the institutions, the industries, the, our entire society actually being racist in terms of how we operate. Um, and I mean, you know, you mentioned sort of the U.S., uh, but, you know, there's plenty of, of examples in, in Canada as well. And, you know, I, I will say one of the simplest ways I've seen systemic racism defined is that, you know, it's, it's even if no single individual was racist, there would still be racism. And, and, you know, for me, that's just a really simple way to put it and understand it. And so I think there are many approaches, actions, initiatives that, you know, need to be taken and implemented to start to, to sort of solve for this. And I don't propose to know what they all are, but I know it's not going to be one single thing that's going to solve for it, right? So I think when we think about, you know, how does one person change? Awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement. I think absolutely those are all relevant. Um, and I think that can really help people move in the right direction and, and can help move organizations along as well. However, I think there's a lot of a lot of deep and hard work that needs to be done. And I think that really starts, uh, you know, frankly, before getting to the change management planning. And it's that work of, you know, what what is it? What do we need to change? How do we, you know, stop and listen and genuinely try to understand what it is that we have to deal with and, and you know, the pieces that need to change? And we probably have to start with acknowledging that, you know, we've been kind of complacently ignoring what we know is there for a long time, um, whether consciously or, or a little bit unconsciously or some combination of, of the two. I think we need to acknowledge that. And I think that implies to, you know, that applies to a, an individual, to a company, to an industry. And I will say, you know, with BOMA, you know, it's something that that we're talking about quite a bit um, and, and trying to find the right path forward. And really, I think it's, like I said, the, the first piece is to just stop and listen and, and make the effort to understand, recognize that there's, um, there's a lot of work to do. We won't get every step right. Um, and we'll have to figure that out. Um, but I think, you know, so I think, yeah, change management, I think will be a piece of it that will come, but I don't think we're even quite there yet. Thanks for sharing that, Nada. We definitely all have a part to play to make sure that this moment doesn't just pass without bringing about real positive and lasting change. So what's one piece of advice you would give to anybody starting out in the commercial real estate industry? Uh, You know, I think it's get better at listening. Um, You know, I think that's especially important right now, you know, just in in the context of of diversity and racism, like we were just talking about. But I think, um, you know, at any point in your career and and where you are, uh, we've kind of been taught, I think, in in to value the individual and to you know, focus on your brand and how do you sort of promote yourself um, and how do you, you know, uh, how do you operate in a meeting and so on and, and about how you speak. And and that's obviously important, but if we can all get a little better at listening, we'll learn so much more and we'll create space uh, for better collaboration and, uh, and you know, and, and better 
partnerships and for a better path forward. I think in any facet, you know, whether we're we're talking about things like racism or uh, or if we're talking about building operations, right? If we can get better at listening to each other, I think we'll uh, we'll collectively be able to to move forward much more effectively. I think that's very apt advice for anyone starting out. I believe it was the Dalai Lama who said, when you talk, you are only repeating what you already know. But if you listen, you may learn something new. So let's get to know you a little more now, Nada. What's a passion of yours that you rarely share with people at work? You know, something I don't talk about a, a ton at work is probably, you know, going to art galleries and and an interest in art. Um, I think, you know, for me, I, I never studied art or anything like that. So I, some years back, decided to just get a membership at the Art Gallery of Ontario and start going. And so that's kind of how I've learned about art. And uh, and it's it's been a lot of fun. And it's sort of, um, you know, I like to... I like to think of it as it's like, it's like my church in the city. If I can get out of the city and, and get into the forest and go on a nice hike, that's kind of my, my church outside of the city. It's so calming and enjoyable. Uh, and when I can't do that, just being able to go to the art gallery is, is such a great way to spend an afternoon or a morning and, uh, and just kind of relax and, and learn, you know, it's a way to learn pieces of history too. So yeah, so I think, I think that's something I probably don't talk about a ton. Are you much of an artist yourself? Um, a bit of photography. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, and it's, it's entirely for my own enjoyment, but, uh, yeah, actually in my, in my home, a lot of the, the photographs that are printed and up, um, are, are a lot of the ones that I've taken myself. So yeah. it's, it's kind of a, it's a nice way to remember, you know, trips and travel and uh, a nice way to just kind of explore. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, before we wrap up, I have five quick fire questions for you. So number one, what book are you currently reading? Um, so some family members got me a, a book at Christmas that I've been, been reading and it's, um, it's called things no one else can teach you. And it's by humble, the poet, who's uh, kind of a Toronto based, you know, hip hop artist and rapper. And it's just, you know, it's really down to earth, sort of simple things like don't take yourself too seriously and, you know, and, and things like listening and stuff like that. And it's just, it's really kind of laid back in a nice, easy, casual read, but a lot of good introspection in there. So yeah, so that's actually what I'm currently reading. Okay, cool. Number two, what book do you recommend to your friends most often? Um, so, you know, a business book that I really, really like is um, The Four Seasons by Isidore Sharp. And I like that because it's a great story about, you know, passion and commitment and drive. And uh, and I, I like that it's kind of, you know, started in Toronto and became this great global hotel chain. Um, and, and, you know, uh, just his eye for innovation in service was really what set the uh, the four seasons apart so yeah it's, it's a great book highly recommend it and is there a, a personal book you recommend to your friends yeah so um this might be a little controversial but um i when i was you know i think in high school kind of my last year of high school and my english teacher uh the library was cleaning out a bunch of old books and kind of giving them away and he handed me ayn rand the fountainhead um, and I had no context, you know, no idea what I was getting into, but it has become one of my favorite books. And while there's, um, you know, certainly aspects of it and uh, the philosophy and, and particularly on the sort of socioeconomic side that don't really resonate with me um, in terms of, uh, you know, there's it kind of ignores uh, the idea of children or the elderly in, in a society, which, you know, makes uh, a real sort of bootstrapping capitalism kind of approach work really well. But um, but you know, aside from that, there were some really, some of the characters I thought were really great, uh, you know, in terms of that, you know, bootstrapping and, and taking care of yourself, um, but also just a real commitment to their own craft. So the, the main character is an architect uh, who refuses to take commissions that he, you know, if the client doesn't, you know, wants it in a certain style, like he's just very, very committed to the way he does his craft and is so true to it that he'd rather be a laborer than than work as uh than than build buildings that he doesn't really um believe in right. so so there's certain aspects of that that really uh yeah that really resonated with me okay number three what recent purchase up to 100 dollars has improved your life a subscription to national geographic i used to subscribe a number of years ago and kind of was like yeah you know what i miss that it's uh it's just it's a wonderful magazine okay number four what what's been your favorite covid19 tv show 
So a show that we started uh, just before COVID hit and then completed in in the early COVID times um, was Succession. And so it's, you know, fictional, but loosely based on sort of the Rupert Murdoch family and, you know, having the the four children about who's who's going to sort of inherit the multimedia moguls empire. Uh, and I mean, they're just ruthless, um, but the, the dialogue's great. There's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of really really good pieces to it, and it's sort of riveting, it, very intense and sort of stressful, but riveting. I totally agree. Succession is a brilliant show, amazing writing and characters, and there's that classic line: "You can't make a tomlet without breaking some Gregs." It's brilliant. And finally, if you could set up a huge banner anywhere, where would you put it, and what would it say? I think I would use um, a quote that a friend of mine who's a fashion designer has, you know, he's made, made a number of, of you know, T-shirts and, and other things uh, with this phrase on it. Um, and it's, it's vibes speak louder than words. And it's something that I just think, you know, it makes a lot of sense. It's like, you know, I can say the nice thing, but if I'm not actually, if my vibe is uh, that I'm actually not feeling in a nice mood or I'm a little bit angry with you, but I'm saying the nice thing, we all know that the words have become irrelevant, right? So, uh, so yeah, so I think that's, that's the one that it's a good reminder. Yeah. Where would you hang it? Oh, that's tough. I think somewhere really, really visible, you know, be like off a bridge over the freeway kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Good. good Probably especially useful uh, for when, you know, when people are on the highway and and they're getting into road rage. Yeah. That's uh, that's probably (laughs) when you need it. (laughs) That's great. Okay, Nada, thank you very much for your time. Really enjoyed speaking with you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rich. Thank you for listening to People Who Perform, the Real Estate Careers podcast brought to you by Highview Partners, a talent search and recruitment firm focused exclusively on Canadian real estate. If your real estate team is looking to find the best next hire, or if you're ready to make the best next move in your career, then reach out to Highview Partners today. Follow us on LinkedIn and visit us at highviewpartners.ca.